Eurocentrism Monotheism and The Epistemology of Decolonization Author Omar Gavarit Dedicated to To my children, Denise and Gaston To my dear colleagues from the operative groups Claudio José González Rinaldi, Frida Celaya, Julio Croci, Maribel Balduini, Silvia Oviedo and Yanina Acosta to the director of the Dr. Enrique Pichon Riviere School in Montevideo Ana Maria Pereira, to the P.S. Sonia Mosquera, to the professors of the Montevideo School of Psychology P.S. Gabriel Ira, and P.S. Alejandro Spangenberg who left an unalterable teaching in me and whom I mention in this work, to Fernando Lopez Lado, Javier Nunez, Adolfo Fito Baran, to the psychologists, Alejandro Acosta, in Buenos Aires, Andres Sarlengo, and to Radio Contrapuntos from the south of the province of Santa Fe, to P.S. Fatima Baltar, to the province of Formosa before which I shared for the first time the epistemology of decolonization. Contents Chapter 1 Hegelian Eurocentrism and The Denigration of the New World Chapter 2 Eurocentrism and Racism in School Textbooks Chapter 3 Nexus and Bond Chapter 4 Eurocentrism and Manifest Destiny Chapter 5 European Intellectual Pessimism Of the 19th Century Chapter 6 Walter Badgett, Herbert Spencer Charles Darwin, and Biological Eurocentrism Chapter 7 Monotheism and Colonialism Chapter 8 American Manifest Destiny Chapter 9 Joseph Needham and Eurocentrism Chapter 10 Social Darwinism in Our Continent Chapter 11 The Mechanism of Historical Transmutation Chapter 12 Identification with the Aggressor Chapter 13 Protestant Congregations An Identification with the Expansionist Aggressor Religious and Political Expansionism Chapter 14 Science and Monotheism Bibliography Start of Content Introduction The social experience throughout the world is much broader and more varied than what the Western scientific or philosophical tradition knows and considers important. The understanding of the world far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. Boventura de Souza Santos we can affirm with certainty that there is still no name that identifies the extensive territorial extension that extends from the Rio Grande in Mexico to Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. The terms used generally, by historians, linguists, politicians, writers, even by anti-imperialist authors are not correct. Terms such as Latin America, Latin America, Pan American, Ibero America, South America, Indo America, Afro-America, Indo-Iberian America, and Indo-Spanish America, whose Eurocentric content has been assumed, internalized, naturalized and integrated as our continental identity. We have assumed an identity that has been imposed on us from the outside, and constructed through a colonialist discourse. These terms abandon, on the one hand, our original nations, leaving them in the open, nations that had already populated these territories long before the arrival of the Spaniards, simultaneously ruling out the Afro-descendant population, and imposing the strict recognition of having been discovered, and forcing us to recognize ourselves thanks to the existence of another. It is then assumed that what Europe discovers, humanity discovers, disregarding that our continent was already populated by technologically advanced civilizations. Almost all of the books in our many libraries are written by European and Eurocentric authors. Europe has ignored the influence it received from Eastern science, philosophy and technology, as well as that which it received directly or indirectly from other civilizations. The little that we know about that has been distorted and distilled by these same European and European-centric authors, and by the construction of historical myths held as truth in textbooks and in many academic circles. We have believed vainly and without exerting any resistance, that the great scientific discoveries began in Europe, that the Middle Ages was a universal historical period, that there was a single Renaissance, a single Iron Age and a single Industrial Revolution, 
and that these historical events were manifested only in Europe and in the West. They have taught us that Greece came to life as if by spontaneous generation, that history is linear, that Europe is the brain of humanity, and the Mediterranean is the navel of the world. We have learned the distorted concept of a bourgeois progress, through which science and technology are supposed to have emerged in Europe for the first and only time. On the other hand, the great empires that spread across our continent, curiously, are not part of Eurocentric Hegelian history, and therefore have not been integrated into ancient universal history, according to the European perspective. The monuments dedicated to Americo Vespucci, Christopher Columbus and his discovery of America still stand, and we celebrate Race Day every October 12th, without understanding the true dimension of its meaning. We open a text entitled, Universal Art to Finish Reading European Art. We open a philosophy book to study Greek and European philosophy, therefore assuming that outside these cultures there is no philosophy. It is necessary to reinterpret and demystify the official story and gradually shed our dusty Eurocentric lenses that distort our reality. Review again and again the textbooks with which our generations study, continuing the investigations of notable linguists and writers such as Sandra Solar Castillo, Zalina Salazar, Pedro Calzadilla, Tiun van Dijk, Cabrera Cisterna, Oscar Morales, Alan Liskinski, and many others. In this way, decolonize the pedagogical colonialism that opposes diversity and plurality of thoughts, complementing European knowledge with the cultural richness of other great civilizations whose extensive libraries have been ignored, underestimated and on many occasions destroyed, by the colonial nations and bourgeois that today became known as the First World. It is necessary to build a continental identity and a universalist and integrative knowledge taking into account that we have been formed, modeled, and created from the European-centric mud and enlivened by the Hegelian breath of European activity. This Hegelian third world, without sustenance, without its own life, expelled from universal history and considered as the dead echo of a first world, comes to represent for France Fanon the zone of non-being, in contrast to the zone of being. Generally we are pleased to cite certain authors from the zone of being as a guarantee to reaffirm and enforce our ideas, because the mere mention of their conspicuous names gives value and relevance to our statements, however, we generally do not do the same. Same with the authors of the zone of not being. It is assumed that if a thought is enunciated from the zone of being it will have a better chance of being truthful. Quoting an author from the zone of being does not mean the same thing as quoting another author from the zone of not being. While the first has the social eventuality of being disseminated more quickly, of being heard, enthroned, ranked, applauded, admired, and published, the second, in the zone of not being, still expressing the same contents, or perhaps more elaborate, it will hardly have the same chances of recognition as the first. In the zone of non-being there is a worldview that makes its own critical thinking invisible, preventing notable thinkers from being known and recognized, and their works remain in the shadows. It is necessary then to value our authors, thinkers, scientists, writers, writers, men and women with great potential and that our own culture has kept them in the shadows. Manuel Ugart, called Great Homeland to this enormous territorial extension that extends from the Rio Bravo to Tierra del Fuego. However, we still do not have an official name, accepted and shared by all, that identifies us as such. Throughout all this work, I have decided to remember the great extension that goes from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego with the name of Abiyayala which means mature, living, flourishing land, a name that was chosen by our original nations, in the Second Continental Summit of Indigenous Peoples and Nationalities in 2004. It is necessary to deconstruct a centennial building of foreign, internalized convictions, to build our own identity, moving away from historical Eurocentric myths. The freedom of our nations cannot be fully achieved through a declaration of independence. We still continue to be dependent from an unconscious dimension, not only by the dominance of external forces, but mainly by subordinate internal forces with which we identify without any resistance or manifest imposition. We passively submit ourselves so that it is others who govern our national existence, and emotionally, those who decide and think for us, passively waiting for approval, the final word or the definitive indication to make decisions. 
there is a structural dependency that characterizes our nations, in such a way that we are historically and constitutively dependent. Political independence must be at the same time an economic independence, but above all there must be a psychic independence that liberates our subordinate thought. We strive for protection, approval, and approval. Beyond a social, political, and economic issue, it is primarily an issue that affects our civilization, it is structural and emotional, since our thoughts are those that are colonized and captive by the fear of freedom. The revolutions have produced the political balkanization of our continent of Ayala, preventing the unity of this vast territory. However, there is also an internal, psychic balkanization, built primarily in our unconscious. As William W. Kaufman, John Street, and Arthur Preston Whitaker put it, not even our political independence has arisen exclusively from ourselves, it came to light through the action of English expansionism, which financed our freedom to dissipate the Spanish and Portuguese influence of the continent, and thus be able to exploit the natural resources of this living land. In this 21st century, we must set ourselves ambitious challenges. We are persuaded that the end of European and American hegemony as reference of Western hegemonic culture is approaching. We must make the unconscious conscious, make visible what is still in darkness, ignore ourselves to get to know each other, become aware of the colonialist Eurocentrism that has permeated all the manifestations of our life, and that has been part of it for five centuries. We have already started this process. The seemingly lost echo of the isolated and forgotten voices of the past is being heard with greater intensity. The movements for ecology, the liberation of women, inclusion, participation, dialogue, the exchange of discourses, independence, tolerance, respect for ideas, multidiversity, ethics in favor of life, and love of life, are movements that even without being aware of it, are eroding at the same time, and without knowing it the influences of European-centric colonialism and disintegrating hegemonies. We must educate and be educated for freedom, not for submission. Work to achieve the unity of our Abiyayala, opposing the imperialist balkanization of our continent, and continue the political project of continental unity. It is essential to understand that our dependence is not conscious and that it operates from the abyssal depths, unknown, already impelled by forces beyond our control. Culture and expansionist education are in charge of preserving this buried reality. We celebrate our independence. We believe that colonization is a matter of the past, an external matter and that it can only be revealed through politics, that it is absurd and old-fashioned to believe in colonialism, because we are already independent, democratic, and free nations. However, I am not referring to the continuity of a colonial administration, on our continent, but to the continuity of a psychic colonialism, a feeling of unconscious submission, where we continue to identify ourselves and reproduce the paradigm of a few Western nations. It makes us uncomfortable to accept that we are moved by unconscious and irrational forces that we cannot control, which shape our behavior, and that these forces come from a remote past and continue to this day. The change must go through culture, our mission is cultural. Universities and in a broad sense institutionalized teaching, have been captured by these colonial Eurocentric forces that are culturally impregnated, and have been internalized, naturalized, and integrated under mimetic forces through the illusion of a universal logic. This naturalization does not allow us to become aware of the origin of Eurocentric knowledge, which historically comes from a few hegemonic nations located north of the Pyrenees, erected as a universal paradigm, as a world cultural pattern. Therefore, it is intended that we maintain the Eurocentric lenses to look at reality and look at ourselves, through which the worthy, laudable, and important indigenous cultural creations are underestimated. Each culture is required to be universally interpreted through a reduced epistemology from a few countries geographically located in Northern Europe, self-proclaimed as the only ones to generate critical social theory. We have believed in this fallacy and therefore we continue trying to apply the Eurocentric epistemology to our knowledge, while our critical discourse is still made invisible by our own nations. Although it is true that decolonization is a libertarian process that involves both the colonizing nations and the colonized nations, since both have been held captive because they are a linking relationship, 
I am not writing only for the colonizing nations, but rather for the nations. Colonized so that it is possible to become aware of these unconscious forces and to continue this process of change. To the extent that the colonized nations free themselves, they will at the same time set the colonizing nations free, because freedom is a binding process. The behavioral sciences have often addressed the immediate social context while ignoring the great influence of historical forces. Colonial Expansions in the Present This is because the same authors, unconsciously imbued by the deep internalization of historical contents, have not been able to notice these Eurocentric forces, which have gone totally unnoticed and naturalized. We believe we are free and independent, capable of choosing, thinking, and acting for ourselves, we believe that there is no longer anyone to tell us what to do. However, now that we have the task of thinking for ourselves and walking upright on our own two feet, we realize that this seemingly absent tyrant continues his existence under unconscious forms and bonds of dependency. Therefore, we have in our hands the decolonizati on task, being persuaded that our generations will thank us. We must decolonize knowledge, affections, economics, politics, art, thought, discourse, education, institutions, Eurocentric logic. This surreptitious colonialism is not only outside of us, it is also internal, irrational, and unconscious. It is necessary to know the colonizing process to undertake an inverse path, a path that leads us towards an opposite and gradual process of deconstruction, to erect a new reality. We must overcome those unconscious effective forces that drive us to feel exiled in our own condominiums, to feel alien to the nations in which we live and without achieving a sense of belonging and identity. We want to return to the Europe from which we come, we do not feel totally identified with being different, however we are. We are not Europe, nor are we European. And if we give up on looking at ourselves in the mirror of Europe? Jorge Luis Borges has a reflection on this question, in my opinion, it is a tragedy for South America. And now, where do we direct our eyes? Borges is a typical representative of what we want to be, a European. We consider him the best writer because in reality we have been motivated by psychological forces that satisfy the unconscious desire of many writers on our continent and in the intellectual world. That is, the desire to be European. In the same way that Borges we resist being from here, and we want to be from there, to feel that we are there, sharing tastes, fashion, lifestyle, art, music, in short, we feel like exiles in a land that is alien to us. I think it is possible to visualize three stages in the Western colonization and decolonization process in more than 500 years of expansionism. The first I have called the proper colonization stage, and it extends from the beginning of the 15th century to the beginning of the Enlightenment. The second stage designated political decolonization that extends from the Enlightenment to the end of the Second World War where nations gradually become independent from the colonial powers, from a political dimension. The illustration has been important for the outcome of the French Revolution, the fall of the old regime and the independence of the United States. Likewise, the Spanish-American Empire is disintegrating, Portugal loses Brazil, and European overseas dreams are being renounced and a third stage that I have called the decolonization of thought that extends from the end of the Second World War to the present day, being more intense at the end of the 20th century, where there is greater awareness that colonization is not only about political character, which also operates unconsciously, projecting itself beyond the rupture of political dependence, and which permeates the totality of the national being. The decolonization of thought and consciousness of Eurocentrism is a recent phenomenon. It is necessary to awaken our conscience to be able to account for the enormous influence that culture has on each one of us and to understand that the Eurocentric naturalized culture is a partialization perceived as a universal totality. Eurocentrism is a dimension of Western colonialism, as are many derived expansionist doctrines. Racism, sexism, misogyny, misanthropy, and hatred towards the original nations are part of that colonialist spirit. Colonialism does not necessarily mean the invasion and exploitation of a colony, subjugation, segregation, suppression of certain civil rights, appropriation of land and its resources, 
territorial usurpation through military force, to impose power there. Political, economic, social, cultural, and religious. Colonialism permeates all orders of human life, it takes over bodies, constructs logic and discourses, makes indigenous creations invisible, creates unconscious bonds of dependency, builds myths, has a racist, patriarchal, sexist character, despises dialogue, diversity, community building and unity. It is imposed as a paradigm, justifies and rationalizes violence as the only alternative to achieve the expansion of progress. It extends in time, it is mimicked, it is transmuted in different unrecognizable ways, it imposes on us a reality as the only one, it is based on having and not on being, it is moved by power, before which it tends to submit, and it despises at the same time the weakness to which it subdues. He feels little or no pity for the weak, and for the weakness in itself, for the needy, poverty, and the poor whom he blames for their condition, and powerlessness. He is conservative, he does not want structural changes that may harm their interests, and that benefit the most underprivileged. It is driven by historical expansionist forces of a religious nature. It universalizes culture, demands that everyone resembles it, does not have a collective conscience, does not respect cultural diversity, projects itself from power, and never from the most suffering sectors which it ignores and despises. Starting in 1492, the idea of an old world as the center of humanity was built. From that moment on, the only civilization that will rise above all others will be the Western civilization, the rest of humanity will become the periphery. Enrique Dussel notably expresses that modernity justifies violence, and that this historical period was born at the moment when Europe was able to confront the other. That other was not uncovered as other but was covered as the same. The other disappeared, the Indian was not discovered as other, but as the same already known, as Asian, recognized and denied as undercover other. The covered has been uncovered but immediately covered up. It does not surprise me that a speech written by a subject so hungry for precious metals, trying to load them into the holds of his caravels to bring them before the crown, has seen the Indian as a poor individual, without religion tearing them from their social environment to take them captive to Castile, having them as good slaves, easy to subjugate, to Christianize to hold them as prisoners on some island and do whatever is wanted of them, falsely earning their trust to plunder them, and steal their belongings, thus feeding the geophagy of their highnesses. It does not surprise me that a great epistemological effort has been made to justify this first encounter between the Columbus fleet and the inhabitants of the so-called New World, justify plunder, oppression and at the same time declare Christian piety, interpreting this fact as, beautiful conquest of America, an event worthy of being solemnly celebrated for the whole of humanity or the second creation of the world. It does not surprise me that reality must have been violated to fit perfectly with the good intentions of the heroes, explorers and travelers who have continued with the noble process of discovery, where the American continent was in darkness until the light of European expansionism came. In that first contact, the European interpreted the nakedness of the Indians and their natural environment as the biblical representation of the paradise of Genesis. A state of innocence, a childish phase of humanity, a stage of immaturity, lacking awareness of nudity, but at the same time, an offense before the modest European Christian customs. A clash between Spanish refinement and native rudeness. They lacked the ability to see the autochthonous inhabitants as humans, they were seen as something indefinite, neither black nor white, neither one thing nor the other, neither human nor animal, perhaps possessing a soul or perhaps not, such once human but with hair similar to horsehair. Helpful beings, who did not represent a threat, did not know weapons, lacking religion, easy to Christianize and therefore enslave, to kidnap as trophies, to learn the Spanish language to use as translators because unlike many animals, these they understand easily and follow orders promptly. Colonization requires the meekness of the colonized. Identity theft is intrinsically related to colonization, the kidnapping of bodies, affections, technology, knowledge, ideas, the appropriation of the other, of proper names, 
changing the original geographical names for various substitute names, many of them Christian, and at the same time substituting pagan names. Therefore, 1492 was the origin of a myth, a process of covering up of the non-European. Europe is constituted as the center of the world, origin of the myth of the birth of modernity, therefore, the Abiyala continent is constituted in the first periphery of modern Europe. Religious racism, footnote, I have expanded the concept of racism beyond skin color. When I speak of religious racism I refer to the Calvinist idea of predestination. Its intangible religious content was later transmuted, resulting in visible racist content and scientific rationalizations. End of footnote, has been transmuted into philosophical racism to be transmuted into biological, scientific, and cultural racism. We must constantly shake off the dust of the Eurocentric influence that, impregnated in our clothes, is reluctant to shed. However, we forget that this process, because it is a link, not only affected the covered new world, but also the colonizing Europe. This alienated worldview, hatred, contempt for life itself sooner or later returns, and one suffers in some way. By covering up the other, by subjugating it, by separating it, eliminating it, and oppressing it, Europe fragmented itself, subsequently applying the same logic on its own continent, bringing upon itself and upon humanity the great wars that ravaged it the first half of the 20th century. It is worth highlighting the influence that I have given to the thought and the psychological structure of Christocentrism and in a more general sense to monotheocentrism in the expansionist process as it is a pristine device of power that has set the stage for political and military expansionism. I will use the terms Eurocentric and Eurocentric interchangeably. In the same way, I will mention colonialism and imperialism that, although they differ from each other, I will indicate them as synonyms, taking into account that these terms not only express an external but also an internal, an unconscious force. Many contents of this subject have been treated by the generation of 900 from the literary and political point of view, reflected in some ideas of José Irodo, and Manuel Ugarte among others. Later, in the 1950s, it was treated more intensely from a political angle by Arturo Jorich, and the foundation of Forja. And later, from a religious perspective by liberation theology through the ideas of Leonardo Boff, Jorge Camilo Torres, Gustavo Gutierrez, and Ruba Malves. I think it is important to continue an analysis of colonialism and Eurocentrism from unconscious aspects, since their influence is deeply internalized and culturally camouflaged in such a way that their existence has been naturalized, without being fully aware of these irrational forces. In these 500 years of growing colonial influence, the human has displayed his war power over himself he has discarded himself, he has segregated, he has colonized himself. He violently appropriated natural resources, colonizing them for himself. In the same way, it colonized the affections, the will, the ideas, the body, and the possessions. This process has moved from an old, evident, visible, and external perspective, through the appropriation and expropriation of the body, the emotions, and the will, towards the control and possession legal, surreptitious, concealed and civilized, infusing the idea of freedom, but taking possession of belongings through more refined and less violent methods. We do not have adequate words to express our theme, in such a way that we must create words to replace the ones we are used to, words that I have had to quote as inappropriate, and therefore, from my perspective, they should be replaced. This move will help change our thoughts. Words produce speech and build realities. Words like race, Indian, Creole Aboriginal, West East Natives, Savage, Progress Development, Empire, First World, Third World, Peripheral Nations, Center Nations, and many others. Instead of using Latin America, or similar terms, I will use, our continent or great homeland. We must continue working in the field of semiology. There are many words that we must gradually replace. I have not had time to create enough words to replace others and change the colonialist discourse, therefore I have put quotation marks on them. 
We use terms, concepts, and ideas that have been historically inherited and legitimized, and that build a reality, in our case a culture of dependency. We have adopted and internalized them as a constitutive part of the social body. We must therefore avoid the manipulation and colonization of language. We must decolonize language. The colonialist culture has imposed its own expressions that we have assumed as ours, therefore, it is necessary to achieve an isotopic rupture of the colonial discourse. I have substituted man for human with a capital letter to refer to both men and women, understanding that this term implies a construction work in ourselves to achieve changes and continuous learning. On some occasions I have left the term man because I have interpreted that the discourse of the social context of the time is not taking women into account. The concept of human must be an aspiration, the development and realization of our human potentialities of solidarity and humanity, a dynamic act of will, decision, learning, patience, communication, collective work and not just a rigid established concept. Solely by culture or biology. I will not accept the terms civilization and progress strictly related to technological, scientific, or having advances. I interpret these terms intrinsically related to being, and not to having, with the development of those potentialities, of care, solidarity, responsibility, and love of life itself. In such a way that only under this circumstance, we must understand that we are more civilized or less civilized as long as we have learned to develop these human virtues. The human has been conqueror and conquered, victim and perpetrator in this process of becoming historical. However, it is precisely Western colonialism, since the beginning of the 14th century that has been driven by monotheistic forces, making it a different expansionism. I firmly hold, and have tried to demonstrate, the enormous influence that monotheism still has in the construction of historical violence, patriarchal forms of expression, and in the imposition of the West as the only universal civilization. I believe that the concept of humanity began its existence with the appearance of Christianity, expanding in time with the conquests, and incorporating a remarkable expansive force. This already secularized monotheism has lost its religious character in today's societies but has retained its monotheocentric characteristics. I must make it clear that violence in itself goes beyond the monotheistic or polytheistic influence, therefore, I do not intend to make a distinctive fragmentation between good and bad here. Conflict tends to increase in the case of monotheism. The truth is that monotheism has a remarkable expansive force when considering a single absolute truth about a multiplicity of truths posed by polytheism, which allowed a wider space for the development of tolerance in this typology. Monotheistic intolerance has been transmuted in space and time, it has become secularized, it has been losing its religious content, however, it still retains its features, its character and its tendency towards violence, competition, exclusivity, authoritarianism, racism, expansionism, patriarchy, confrontation, exploitation, warmongering, confrontation, fanaticism, homogeneity, the concept of the latest and the true. Fortunately we have advanced a lot in this process of change, we are heading from a cultural monotheism, towards a cultural polytheism, where the diverse will rise more and more over the unitary, and the concept of the only truth will lose strength, and we will see it smaller and smaller, moving away in time. Omar Gavarit Chapter 1 Hegelian Eurocentrism and The Denigration of the New World the Greek miracle, like the scientific revolution, is thus condemned to remain a miracle. But what alternative is there, apart from chance? Only the doctrine that a certain group of peoples, in this case the European race, was somehow intrinsically superior to all other groups of peoples. Against the scientific study of human races, against physical anthropology, comparative hematology, there is, of course, no objection but the theory of European superiority is racism in a political sense, and has nothing to do with science. I am afraid that for European autonomism we are the people, and wisdom was born with us. But, since racism, in its explicit forms, at least, is neither intellectually respectable nor internationally acceptable, 
autonomists are in a quandary that we can hope will become increasingly apparent as time goes on. Therefore, I confidently look forward to a great revival of interest in the relations between science and society between the crucial European centuries, an increasingly intense study of the social structures of all civilizations, and a definition of the different splendor they attained. In summary, I believe that the analyzable differences in economic and social structure between China and Europe will clarify, as much as any other knowledge, the ancient predominance of Chinese science and technology and also that modern science was born, later, only in Europe. Joseph Needham I will use the terms Eurocentrism and Eurocentrism interchangeably to refer to the idea of Europe as the center and the navel of planetary history, which had its main spokesperson in Hegel. The Eurocentric philosopher celebrates with optimism that Europe is the end of history. We must understand here that Hegel's Europe only counts the German Anglo-Saxon Europe of the North since the South is no longer the carrier of the spirit. This Hegelian racist idea spread in the intellectual world of the 19th century both in Europe and in our continent. In 1882, Leitus Launetto, the director of the National Museum of Brazil, inspired by these same ideas, stated that, having carefully studied the organisms in their gradual descent, and well appreciated the superior qualities that the Indo-Germanic race managed to acquire, the highest expression of human perfection, we find the greatest difference between the most cultured and the most beautiful types of this race, and the most imperfect and bestial human individuals, than the one that exists between the latter and gorillas and chimpanzees. Neto, 1882 it should be noted first that in the field of social psychology, before reading the pages of any author, we must analyze their social, economic, political, industrial, religious context, in which that author lived. Before knowing his writings, it is essential to know their context, without which the author will not be fully understood. On the other hand, it is important to know the personal characteristics, family and contemporary references to the generation of our analyzed author, those who were born before, and had an important influence on him. In the same way, attend to the periods of historical changes, wars, revolutions, scientific discoveries and paradigms of the time. We must take into account the author's theoretical references, the books he cites, the names and authors he mentions those contemporary or extemporaneous writers who influenced or could have influenced his thoughts, in order to carry out a simultaneous study between the ideas of our author, and that of these various references mentioned. These reference can be part of a generation, of a multitude of thinkers within a space and time, and who have influenced one another. Therefore, studying all of them will reveal a greater understanding of the author that we have established, as a reference in such a way that through its pages, the character analyzed by us will cite certain references, and in doing so, will lead us to various sources, which will be very important to us. Based on this, we also have to go to those same references cited to get to know our author in greater depth. Precisely because of what I have mentioned, taking the dates into account is very important, since they place us within a specific historical context. It is essential to place the character within a certain content, therefore, we must know the date of his birth and death, and also carry out a chronological study, comparing it with the other dates, revolutions, historical events, contemporary or extemporaneous characters that have influenced in his ideas, social conditions, revolutions, scientific discoveries. To better understand the analyzed character we must carry out parallel readings, also understanding the mechanism that we call historical psychic transmutation, a mechanism that I will describe in detail later. Each of us is also influenced by a previous historical process, by unconscious, irrational forces that come from a remote historical past and that are gradually transmuting, changing shape, moving in different knowledge and directions, but preserving certain contents over time, already distorted and unrecognizable in the present. It can be strange, ridiculous, and disjointed, to conceive that certain very distant historical events continue to affect us in the present. However, the process of transmutation will show us that the historical generational extension has to take place through constant changes and deformations of a content into a different content but preserving elements of the past, 
of previous models that are continuously transformed and deformed over time and in space. Hegel, lived 30 years of his life in the 18th century and 31 years in the 19th century, in such a way that he lived the period of the Enlightenment, Romanticism, the Victorian era, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the wars Napoleonic, the colonization of Africa and Australia. We must study it in the context of European colonial expansion into the Americas, the rise of the American Empire, rising capitalism, the 19th century explosion of racism, slavery and the Antilles Revolution. Born the same year as Beethoven, he was a contemporary of such writers as Gotthold Lessing, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Friedrich Schiller and the poet Friedrich Hold Erlen. He was also a contemporary of Simon Laplace, Antoine Lavoisier, of the geographers Karl Ritter and Alexander von Humboldt, of Benjamin Smith Barton, of novelists, Nicholas Lena, Giacomo Leopardi, Pierre Simon Balanc, Fabre de Olivet, Dupont de Nemours, the paleontologist Cuvier, Blumenbach, Karl Linneau, Eberhard August Wilhelm Zimmermann, Francois Volney Constantin, Perrin Dulac, John Keats, Lord Byron, Thomas More, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Franz Warrenet Chateaubriand, Jeremy Bentheim, Arthur Schopenhauer, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Kant, Rousseau, Robespierre, Thomas Jefferson, Washington, John Adams, Franklin, and Napoleon Bonaparte. While Hegel lived, in our continent the Declaration of Independence of Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Haiti, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela was signed. After having thoroughly studied the social context in which the character lived, we will only be able to begin to undertake it, therefore, we will need a certain time to first analyze his social context. It is insufficient to open a text, and read any author directly, without previously scrutinizing the context in which that author lived. We cannot know our character, and at the same time ignore his context. Even in our university teaching, we are taught to open a book and immediately begin the study of a particular author, often neglecting its context. We also believe that the ideas presented by our author have to be applied universally because we have internalized the Eurocentric trend established as a global paradigm. A given historical event will be interpreted differently depending on the social context from which it is viewed. The fact will be the same, but the interpretation made of it will be different. We can create a compendium of thick and numerous volumes of world history, and consider that we have said it all. That we don't need to write any more works, assuming that all history has already been written in those thick volumes. This would be illogical, since there is a need for new interpretations, and this need does not necessarily lie in the historical facts themselves, but in the new questions that arise about history. In this way, for example, Greece was built as the cradle of civilization by the Romantics of the 19th century, however that concept previously did not exist as such. Hegel had the fragmented idea of existence, he interpreted it through colonialist and Eurocentric lenses. The German philosopher excludes America, from universal history and philosophy, since he supposes that what is known as the New World does not mean anything in itself, has no value of its own, and can only be recognized through of Europe. What has taken place in the New World up to the present is only an echo of the Old World, the expression of an alien life, Hegel, 1994, p. 110. Of these arrogant ideas, the echo represents the propagation of sound, of the voice of the new world but not its own voice, only the sound whose waves crash against the dead walls that reproduce it and give it meaning. The expression new world supposes its existence thanks to the old world. It is admitted that he has neither voice, nor life of his own. Together with Africa they represent only a geographical base not historical and devoid of the future, something like an empty and powerless container whose existence is only necessary for European civilization and progress to develop in it. The concept of history was born recently in the industrialized bourgeois nations, where the idea of time was greatly precipitated by industrial production. Mircea Ilyad affirmed that memory is characteristic of historical man, 
but not of the archaic man who rejects it because he refuses to register the irreversible passage of time, Eliada, 1984, p. 11. In this way, the life of man in traditional societies consists of a profane time, a time of becoming or historical time, which is stripped of all value and a sacred time through which it is installed in what it considers to be true reality, that of the indefinite reproduction of a primordial act, which was established by gods, ancestors or heroes and which he repeats without interruption. The archaic man lives, then, in the paradise of archetypes, which allows him to reject history. Eliada, 1984, v. In the original nations, time is not transformed into history, man and woman are constantly regenerated and the past is consumed. The regeneration of the history of the town is produced by a new sovereign, birth marriages, where a new era begins. For the cosmos and man are constantly regenerated, and by all means, the past is consumed, evils and sins are eliminated in various formulas, all those instruments of regeneration tend towards the same goal, to annul the elapsed time, to abolish history through a continuous return in illo tempere by the repetition of the cosmogonic act. Eliada, 1984, p. 76. Hegel establishes a dividing line, and places Europe on one side, and the rest of humanity on the other. Influenced by Buffonian ideas, Hegel believed in the inferiority of the inhabitants, animals and even plants of the New World. He assumed that the New World emerged from the waters at the creation of Genesis, at the same time as the Old World, however, he claimed that the islands near the New World demonstrate physical immaturity. I do not intend to take away from the New World the honor of having also emerged immediately from the waters when the world was created. However, the Sea of Islands between South America and Asia shows physical immaturity, most of these islands are of such a constitution that they become a kind of earthy cover on rocks emerged from an unfathomable depth, and bear the traces of being something originated late. Hegel, 1970, p.105 I think it is important to expose each of Hegel's own words to analyze them, both in his Lechonese sobre la philosophia de la historia universal, and in his Philosophia de la Historia. He also states that the New World may have once been united with Europe and Africa. But in modern times, the Atlantic lands, which had a culture when they were discovered by the Europeans, lost it when they came into contact with them. The conquest of the country marked the ruin of its culture, of which we keep news, but they are reduced to letting us know that it was a natural culture, that it was to perish as soon as the spirit approached it. America has always revealed herself and continues to reveal herself powerless physically as well as spiritually. The natives, since the landing of the Europeans, have been perishing under the breath of European activity. In animals themselves there is the same inferiority as in men. The fauna has lions, tigers, crocodiles, etc., but these beasts although they have a remarkable resemblance to the forms of the old world are, however, in every way smaller, weaker, more powerless. They claim that edible animals are not as nutritious in the new world as the old. There are large herds of cattle in America, but European beef is considered there as an exquisite snack. As far as the human race is concerned, only a few descendants of the first Americans remain. Some seven million men have been exterminated. The inhabitants of the islands, in the West Indies, have passed away. In general, the entire American world has gone to ruin, displaced by Europeans. The tribes of North America have disappeared or have withdrawn at the contact of Europeans. They decline little by little and it is clear that they do not have enough strength to join the Americans in the free states. These peoples of weak culture perish when they come into contact with peoples of higher and more intense culture. In the free states of America, all citizens are European emigrants, with whom the former inhabitants of the country cannot mix. In South America and in Mexico, the inhabitants who have the feeling of independence, the Creoles, have been born from the mixture with the Spanish and the Portuguese. Only those have been able to rise to the high feeling and desire for independence. They are the ones who set the tone. There are apparently few indigenous tribes who feel the same way. 
No doubt there are reports of some populations in the interior that have adhered to recent efforts to form independent states, but it is likely that among these populations there are not many pure indigenous people. The English therefore follow in India, the policy that consists of preventing the production of a Creole race, a people with indigenous blood and European blood, who would feel the love of their own country. Hegel, 1994, pages 170 to 171. The disappearance of the original nations took place, according to Hegel, by the contact before the European superior culture, and by the massive eviction. These original nations have disappeared due to the power of war, and because of the unbeatable approach of the spirit of civilization in the powerless presence of the savage, which necessarily perished to the blow of European activity. From my point of view, Hegel's speech expresses some unconscious analogy with the expulsion of the biblical and pagan nations by the hand of the Israelites. Hegel reproduces in the present, the biblical accounts of the past, and is included at the same time, in the scene as a liberator, a divinely inspired prophet, reviving the spirit of providence, who through the Israelites, was in charge of expelling them from their lands and to exterminate them. Hegel unconsciously reproduces the Judeo-Christian messianic theophany. The disappearance of the savage whose idolatrous life is energetically opposed to the divine will according to the Judeo-Christian perspective must be carried out directly through human warlike ends, but also taking into account the divine cooperation that, as a permanent ally, will be in charge of completing the extermination. Hegel supposes that the faculty of independence belongs to the European and to a lesser extent to the Creole race. This is because the Criollo has mixed with the native population, thus losing its expansive capacity. In addition, the Creole represents a threat to the European, since he could rebel against the colonies, create a national identity, and at the same time come to see the savage with a certain liking. The influence of the Buffonian thesis of zoological inferiority, as we shall see later, is similar in Hegel. A race is superior when it has the ability to displace, and exterminate another, we will see in what way Walter Badgett and Spencer had the same criteria, having been influenced by social Darwinism. However, geological, zoological and botanical superiority are related to irrational and inexplicable forces, which have decided that reality is like that, as if by providential whim. In this fantastic belief, the Protestant influence of Calvinist predestination in Hegel is envisioned, which has whimsically decided from before the foundation of this world who should be superior and who should be inferior, saved or condemned. The idea of the disappearance of the inferior indigenous culture due to contact with the superior European spirit, bears a certain phylogenetic analogy with the inferior species, when these are displaced by the superior species. Influenced by these same ideas, Sarmiento opposed forming communities made up of Criollos, Therefore, to achieve progress in his country, he thought of populating those lands with a superior race, introducing European settlers and spread through those lands, thus avoiding blood contamination with indigenous impurity. Hegel makes it clear that the New World bears that name because it was recently recognized by European navigators. Europe, according to Hegel, gave history to the conquered peoples, the indigenous, they are totally inferior to the European of America and its culture, especially as regards Mexico and Peru, it is true that we have news, but they tell us precisely that their culture had a completely natural character, destined to be extinguished as soon as the spirit approached it. America has always been and continues to be lazy, both physically and spiritually. Since the Europeans landed in America, the indigenous people have been declining little by little, at the blow of European activity and with them the Aborigines could not support themselves, but were displaced. These natives, however, have learned some arts from the Europeans, among others that of making alcoholic beverages, which, incidentally, produced disastrous effects among them. In the South, the Indians were treated with much harsher and employed in hard jobs for which they lacked sufficient strength. The main character of the Americans of these regions is a meekness and lack of impetus, as well as a humility and creeping submission in the face of a Creole, and even more so in the face of a European, and it will be a long time before Europeans come to instill in them a little self-love. 
The inferiority of these individuals in every way, even with regard to height, can be appreciated in everything. Hegel, 1994, p. 105. Hegel establishes a dichotomy between the natural and the spiritual. From my point of view, these concepts are the result of the historical transmutation that takes its course from Protestant theology, preserving certain characteristics that, although they are applied philosophically in the present, continue to belong to a certain extent in the domain of theology. When he refers to a natural and spiritual culture, Hegel has translated, transmuted, unconsciously, theological into philosophical content. For our philosopher, the world is separated by an abyss between two well-defined sectors, on the one hand, beings predestined by nature or providence, namely, the Anglo-Saxon Europe of the North, the one that promotes progress, the one that writes history and on the other hand, the beings that are born predestined to obey and be subjected. The idea of predestination not only represents the light motive in Calvinist theology, but has been transmuted historically into the ideas of Hegel. Therefore, humanity according to Hegel is divided between the strong and the weak, the natural and the spiritual, the old world, and the new world, where what is considered weak will tend to disappear in the presence of the strong is that is, the European presence. Translated from Calvinist theology, humanity is divided into predestined for life and predestined for death. The breath or breath is a reference to the creation of Genesis from which this breath of European activity results the transmutation of a theological, previous, original breath capable of giving life, or of taking it away. Europe becomes the bearer of a providential mission, that of blowing on humanity, thus generating the life of progress. It must be supposed that the breath of European activity has the divine property of vivifying. At the same time, the natural philosophical concept that for us translates as weak, famished, inferior, and wild, is the passage of the transmutation of the natural concept in theology. The influence of Protestant theology on his philosophical ideas is notorious, 1 cor 2.14, 1 cor 15-46. This natural man represents the culture oppressed by the European spiritual man and whose redemption can be obtained through that breath of European activity which he incarnates by transmutation to the breath of the theological providential spirit. The natural and wild man must be educated by the superior European culture that has to instill in him a little self-love. This natural state implies physical and spiritual weakness, meekness, lack of impetus, creeping submission which equates to the concept of humility, similar to lazy children not sensitive to higher European culture. The idea of Confusing humility, peace, and kindness with submission has been pronounced, as we will see, by other authors, defenders of Eurocentrism and the ideas of the American Manifest Destiny. Peaceful nations are condemned, for their pacifism, for failing to protect themselves, and simultaneously colonialist plunder is rationalized. These defenseless and peaceful nations are supposed to allow and passively wait for other more powerful nations to oppress them. They are supposed to cowardly resist defending themselves. The authoritarian character can only identify two groups of subjects, the oppressors and the oppressed, thus confusing meekness with the desire to be subdued. History is supposed to be built only by man, male, European, white, heterosexual, and of the Christian religion. Heidegger went so far as to affirm that blacks are also human beings, but they have no history. Hegel also tells us that the black represents, as we have already said, the natural man, indomitable and incomplete barbarism, when we want to understand it well, we have to make an abstraction of everything that is respect and objective morality, as well as everything that is called feeling, in this character you cannot find anything that sounds human. The long accounts of the missionaries fully confirm all this, and only Mohammedanism seems to be the only thing that brings Negroes a little closer to civilization. Hegel, 1970, pages 116 to 117. More than a hundred years after Hegel wrote his Philosophia de la Historia, Kissinger responded to the Chilean Chancellor Gabriel Valdez in 1969 the following You just made a weird speech. It was here to talk about Latin America, 
when that is not important. Nothing important could come from the South. The story has never taken place in the South. What happens in the South is not important and he added Latin America can sink into the sea that nothing new or important would happen in the world. Chavala, 2005, p82. It is important to appreciate the similarity of Kissinger's speech to that of Hegel despite the time that has elapsed. Hegel wrote the following. Thus, in general, the temperate zone is the one that the theater has to offer for the drama of universal history, and within the temperate zone, the northern part is the most suitable. In it the continent forms a broad chest, 